it feels like tremendously unjust, especially when you think about how many, how many lives could have been saved by accelerating the R&D pipeline and getting certain cures to diseases five years earlier, 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier. Um, there's tons of things that have happened and in the course of history took one path and you know, billions of people died because we did things a certain way as opposed to if we had accelerated all our R&D and been able to kind of you know, save that many lives. The kind of R&D pipeline has this, this quality that um, the groups that tend to invent things first tend to define how they get used and how they shape society. So you definitely want the people that invent things first to have as good aims as possible. My name is Juan Benet and I started Protocol Labs. We are pushing humanity forward. What I mean by pushing humanity forward is that there are some really important improvements that, that are going to be unlocked by, by our species over the next you know, 50, 100, 200 years. And like the last few hundred years, um, we've seen an enormous amount of progress in, in a bunch of ways, often fueled by our scientific discoveries and how we translate those scientific discoveries into improvements. So think, think of like things like sanitation and vaccines and figuring out electricity and magnetism and thermodynamics and being able to like from there create different kinds of transportation and telecommunications and um, you know every form of transport and, and so on. So all of those kinds of improvements have been accelerating and now we kind of discovered something extremely powerful, which is computing. Uh, you know, people sort of like tend to remark that computing is this super powerful thing, kind of like the invention of telecommunications, or say, no, no, it's even bigger than that. It's kind of like the invention of the printing press, or no, it's like writing itself, or like language itself is like that magnitude of an improvement. All of those um, are still undershooting. Uh, I think digital computing is something as fundamental as life itself. Um, life is a form of computing, it's just kind of chemical computing in very small scales. And so humanity has sort of like unlocked this extremely powerful set of uh, concepts and technologies. And um, ever since we started working with computing, it has started to change our species at a much faster rate than almost any technology that we've had in the past. Um, today, like we're, we're just fundamentally different species than, than we were 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. And that change and shift is going to keep accelerating. Think about the last 80 years and how computing has changed things. Think of like, we now have the, you know, these amazing superpowers like we're able to you know, call anyone in the world or like broadcast information to everybody in the world or like um, you know, live stream something or look up any piece of information or knowledge that humanity has, learn how to do anything. You, know, like you, you ride a bike, you like get a flat tire, you like stop, look up a video on YouTube of like how to, how to change a flat tire and like you, you can do it, right? So it's like a massive unlock for, for humanity. And that's going to just not, not only keep compounding, but it's going to get dramatically more uh, impactful once we figure out things like virtual reality and augmented reality and then brain computer interfaces and you know, much more advanced AI systems and robotics. And so all of these changes are going to come sometime over the next you know, um, 40 to 80 years. And when those arrive, um, there'll be huge shifts in how we operate and how we exist as humans. Um, and so they'll, they'll kind of like change humanity again. And um, it's really important in those moments that we aim for really good outcomes. So we don't get to um, have super high certainty over how those things are going to get developed, but we can try really hard to aim for really good use cases that uh, benefit everybody and kind of uh, fight against like really bad use cases where, because a lot of these technologies tend to be dual use, right? Like where you could use them for like really good uh, use cases or in a destructive capacity, right? So think of nuclear power is, is kind of like the famous example where you can use nuclear power to get like free, basically free energy for everybody, or you can use it to build nuclear weapons. And so like that, all of this uh, computing technology can be used for really good things or really bad things. And so it's important that groups aim for those really good outcomes. What I want to do with PL is, is build the kind of institution and network that can orient uh, as many groups as possible to both invent a lot of these technologies as fast as we can and aiming towards as good outcomes as we can. I started Pro Collabs when I was running into trouble finding a good place for developing IPFS and Filecoin. Um, I had the idea for IPFS uh, for a while, and I couldn't find like a really good place in which to uh, build a protocol like that. And so I decided to just create the kind of organization and institution that would help other people like me build those kinds of projects. Uh, so I started computer science and um, sort of many other parts of science as well, and history and um, many other fields. 
Uh, I really like learning, and so I've been uh, extremely curious about lots of different different kinds of things. I'd seen, I kind of grew up on the internet, so I got into the internet uh, from a young age. So like, I don't 12 or 13, I was into computers and, and uh, the internet through uh, playing games and uh, then making websites and from there kind of uh, learning how to program and whatnot. I kind of understood from history that technology drove massive amounts of progress, but that, pro that technology and that progress um, was kind of A, fueled by the, the scientific uh, endeavor to try and kind of figure everything out, but B, also very limited by innovation and, and the invention process. So translating new ideas and new concepts into some um, piece of technology that you know, could actually be put into um, a device or a product or something like that and then sold in the market. Uh, there's a thing that, that I've sort of like called the innovation chasm where um, there's a lot of incentives for building products and um, selling them in, in the broad market. Uh, and there's a lot of funding for developing businesses uh, to develop those kinds of products and scale them. And there are some incentives, a lot less, but there are still some incentives for doing research and doing science. And so that means uh, you can get funding for um, doing scientific projects to kind of advance the tree of knowledge and so on. There are very few incentives and very little funding for doing science to technology translation. That means taking some new concepts that have been figured out in science and turn that into some technology or some devices um, and so on. So kind of like the, the concrete problem is that there aren't a lot of resources uh, and, no, and very few incentives to do this kind of fundamental development where you're taking new concepts and new ideas from science and developing them into kind of the early prototypes and the early proof of concepts that might someday turn into products. And so when you look at any area of, of science or any area of technology, any field um, tends to be rate limited by that part, um, by the fact that there aren't uh, strong incentives or a lot of funding in that, in that area. I'm working on this because it's a kind of like deep frustration and disappointment that it doesn't work better. And so it's like, ah, this, is, this sucks, like I have to go fix it. Um, and so like, that's, that's what brought me to try and solve this problem. And you know, I think like, one really good thing is that a lot more people now are kind of becoming aware of this problem space and trying to kind of figure out solutions, but we still don't have anything remotely close to working at scale. Movements and products and systems get built by people, uh, often working for you know, many years or sometimes decades. Many times there's a, there's a lot of kind of long-term value alignment that sort of drops out of those relationships. So um, we think that building kind of, th this sort of like network of builders um, of people that are kind of tackling these really large challenges together, um, kind of relationships are one of the key things that, that can help, you know, kind of align us all to kind of tackle these problems together. The PL Network is just this community with a lot of like uh, really inspiring people that are kind of, um, at the same time, great visionaries, but also great at executing on that vision and great at sort of manifesting dreams and, and sort of like actually pushing humanity forward and, and solving problems. Uh, and so there's like a very strong kind of um, culture that is imbued with the open source ethos of just this broad kind of public goods oriented view of, hey, if we can kind of like solve problems together, um, then the world just gets, it turns into a much better place. This kind of marketplaces or networks tend to be sort of central planning approach where um, groups and communities kind of self-organize. And just everyone is like super friendly and super fun to, to be with. So I think Lab Week has been amazing to just get to hang out with everybody and get to spend time together. We want to work with groups that are working at the forefront of technology and that are, that are creating some important new um, capability or modality or something like that. So definitely deep in the R&D pipeline and creating new products that are going to be kind of transformative in some way and, and, and highly scalable in some way. Um, so kind of a lot of the, the classic technology growth company type of stuff applies. However, we tend to also look much further back in the R&D pipeline. So things that are much earlier than um, kind of traditional venture capital might look. The area that we think is, is uh, most underserved and actually where some of the most important things get built um, is this kind of squarely in the middle of the innovation chasm where things are translating from scientific results into really vi valuable products. Groups that sort of span that pipeline um, are, are most interesting. A huge fraction of the network is very focused on working in Web3, so lots of Web3-oriented um, networks and companies and, and DAOs and so on are part of the network, so that means anything related to cryptocurrency and decentralized computing networks or decentralized storage or decentralized science, uh, so all of those kinds of um, things make sense. But also now, uh, increasingly, a lot more uh, things in kind of other areas of computing. So 
uh, things like AR and VR or uh, robotics and BCI and, and so on. We come from like this very network oriented uh, perspective of trying to just tackle these massive scale problems together. And the open source ethos has been, um, has permeated all of us. And so a lot of the way that we approach building the network and building the resources and, and kind of like why um, we've built up all of this is because we see tackling these very large scale problems together in this kind of open source environment where we'll all benefit from those solutions happening. And often, like if some problem gets solved by some other group, um, that tends to be like, just great, like that problem is not solved, we can move on to the next one. Um, and so that broader public orientation has, you know, kind of really helps us think about, you know, how, how can we kind of save everybody's time, uh, how we can um, try it, like whatever we can solve together, um, let's kind of like lean in that direction. And what's been really cool to see is just how many um, teams across the network are helping each other in a bunch of different ways. So we ha have built a set of programs uh, to create a set of resources, and those are all getting expanded by many teams across the network that are kind of offering office hours and um, coming up with their own uh, sets of offerings to give to the rest of the network. Uh, and that's been, been really awesome to see. Probably the coolest thing is that um, just these large scale undertakings that all of us kind of set off to try and solve are now getting solved a lot faster because there's so many more teams and people working towards them. R&D is this very large, long-term search process of trying many different approaches. Um, often you have to like try many things in parallel um, and it's sometimes hard, very hard to see what will turn out to work or not work. And sometimes you, you, it's totally unpredictable. Like the landscape will change in some way and some approach that maybe at first didn't seem viable suddenly becomes like the right, the right one. Uh, so it's been amazing for me to see so many of the problems that, that, that I've cared about and that many other people care about being tackled by so many people working together. <laughs> when, I, when I started PL, a lot of people were like, oh man, you're like trying to boil the ocean like multiple times over. And it's like, hey, actually, like if we can organize a lot of people, we can definitely like boil the ocean together. So.